to this episode of Shonen Flop, where we talk about manga series and Shonen Jump that didn't make it big. I'm David. I'm Jordan. And this week, we're talking about Hardwell Cop and Dolphin, and we cool are- Cool Frog and Dolphin! I'm sorry, what? There you go, Jordan. Finally made that reference. And yes, I did post it on Twitter like you asked for our chibi episode. Good, good. And so, though, you know what's almost as cool as a frog and dolphin? What? Uh, not much. Our guest today, Joey. Joey. Hey. Oh my god. <laughs> Joey, thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful manga adventure. I really appreciate you recommending the series to us. And do you mind telling the audience just a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me. My name's Joey Weiser. Uh, I'm a cartoonist, author of the brand new graphic novel Dragon Racer, as well as Ghost Hog and the Merman graphic novel series. They're kind of all ages series that are comedy adventure series, kind of in the vein of Shonen Jump, but um, not exactly like Shonen Jump. But I feel like if you like Shonen Jump, you might like my comics. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Can I just say, Joey, I love the titles of your series. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> if you can send me a link to where, like, all of your workers, I definitely want to check you out. We had Xander Kanan on the show, and I've been reading all his comics, so it's really awesome to just actually check out the work for a lot of, for our guests. Kaiju Max is so good. It's so that good, That was cool right? that you had him on there, yeah. And I think all three of the cartoonists, including myself, uh, that you've had on so far have been Oni Press authors, so, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> uh, all under the same publisher. Mm -hmm. We should work out some kind of sponsorship. <laughs> unironically not a bad idea yeah right i was excited to be invited on back when we were first talking about me coming on the series was still running but <laughs> like it was pretty clear that it was wrapping up and so i definitely threw this out as a possibility with a few other titles so glad that uh we chose this one. Oh, for sure i'm glad we chose it too you are also a friend of stephen paul's if i recall that's how I first found out about the show is that uh, I heard about him being on and he Aww. told me about it. To reach into the the, the warm-up body, Stephen Paul is very based. <laughs> if I <laughs> said that right. Up, <laughs> I assume that's good. <laughs> yes. I'm not going to lie. When you didn't mention the One Piece podcast, thinking, knowing Stephen Paul in your initial intro, I was like, oh, fuck, am I thinking of the wrong person? <laughs> No, yeah, no, I forget about that. But yeah, my main thing is is drawing comics, but I'm a podcaster uh, on the side as well. I am frequently on the One Piece podcast. I'm a co-host of a Japanese film club podcast called Toho Yaro that's uh, on hiatus at the moment, but uh, folks can check that out. Yeah, it, we've just been really busy. I'm about to move and stuff. So hopefully starting back up again sometime next year. Oh, dude, that sounds sick. Uh, actually, for one of our first ever movie nights, we watched, was it Yojimbo? Yeah, it was Yojimbo. Nice. Yeah, we started uh, black and white Japanese movies, so then we've uh, slowly gone a little bit more mainstream where we watched Die Hard <laughs> most recently, so. Yo, Jimbo's the Die Hard of, of samurai movies. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's not totally wrong. I feel like Yo, Jimbo and Die Hard are like more similar than they are different in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I also have to say Yo, Jimbo is definitely the samurai movie that most sounds like a BC Boys album. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Jimbo! All right, this is going to be a fun one. And then if I didn't say enough to see Paul, thank you so much for putting us in touch. You are also just a fantastic guest. And there's a new Yotsuba chapter that just drops. I look forward to reading your work mm -hmm. soon. But you know whose work, though, we're really excited to check out is... Ooh, whose is it? Heartbolt Cough and Dolphin. Oh, my God, really? Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> Joey, why don't you mind... Would you mind telling us a bit about the series itself? Hard Boiled Cop and Dolphin is by Ruhei Tamura, who previously did the series Beelzebub, which was a very successful series. Unfortunately, the manga hasn't been licensed in English, so I haven't read it, but there's an anime adaptation that's very popular. I think in between that and this, he did a series called Hungry Marie uh, that was mm -hmm. another uh, <laughs> candidate for Shonen Flop someday. <laughs> it, was, it did not come very long. But this series ran from June 27th, 2020 to June 21st, 2021, so about a year exactly, with five volumes and 47 chapters. Yeah, and then uh, we talked about in the cheap. I think this is what was it, the third longest series we've ever read for Shonen Flop? It might be. Definitely the best series that was over 40 chapters we've read for Shonen Flop. That's good. For the length that it went, especially. I really enjoyed this series, like not to not to spoil it. <laughs> That's a relief to hear. I haven't heard your chibi yet, so I was like. Man, if they don't like this one, the fact that I'm asking them to read almost 50 chapters, that's going to be a little rough. Uh. <laughs> Joey, I trusted you. I also want to say, Joey, you know, I can tell that you're an experienced podcaster because without having to say anything when I introduced you, you started by saying thanks for having me, mm. which is like one of those things where people have never been on podcasts. They don't know that's like 
etiquette where that's like the <laughs> etiquette where you're like oh thanks for having me on they're just like yeah i'm on your show yeah blah 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 so that's how i knew i was like this guy's been on podcast before when you said that <laughs> yeah i know what, how much of a pain in the ass it is to schedule <laughs> it's fine promise you one reschedule very far ahead of the time puts you still in the upper echelon of <laughs> guests that were easy to work with oh my god we almost had a guest where we just straight up recorded a backup episode because we just very strongly didn't think they were actually going to show up mm. oh yeah 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 so no worries at all we, we you're really giving your time to be on the show so we absolutely want to be as flexible and that's why if you notice i had everything kind of just really clear cut and organized because i have to flex that business degree i got i appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> all right but enough about all of that i gave up a really good reason way to transition into about the manga so we're gonna just pretend i said something clever here and get into it where jordan has blessed us with a fantastic plot summary Okay, so first of all, I would like to set out a disclaimer that because this series is almost 50 chapters long, like there's a lot of shit that happens in that I wasn't able to get in the here, in here mm. but I tried to grab the overall structure of the plot. Officer Boyle Samajima is a hard-boiled Tokyo cop who doesn't play by the rules, which gets him transferred to the Ogasawara Islands as a punishment. There, he meets the beautiful officer Yumi Nanase and his new partner Orpheus, a huge dude with a dolphin head, as well as Orpheus's little daughter, Chaco, a cute six-year-old girl who was rescued from a cult that was worshipping her as an oracle. The cult mysteriously vanished out at sea, and since then, the island has been victimized by these weird fish-human hybrids, like, kind of think of uh, the fishmen from One Piece, actually. Mm -hmm. Kind of similar, which are fought off by the duo of Samajima and Orpheus. It's really funny until suddenly the series stops being a gag manga around chapter 14. <laughs> <laughs> Popcorn David, by the way, don't read the parentheses of where I say AKA the fisherman from One Piece because I forgot that I put that in. Oh, there. that was my favorite part. I was actually thinking that the whole time, though. Yeah. I was going to probably freestyle that one. That's what we call it when you uh, don't literally read what Jordan wrote, as it's got me in trouble in the past. <laughs> Feel free to freestyle, though. <laughs> All right. Popcorn David. No. <laughs> the cult reappears led by its guru, Yosuke Kamaro. Kamaro has recruited the Undersea Mafia to reclaim the five limbs of Poseidon known as the Pis Poseidon Dracone. Got it. Yep. Thanks, bud. Which will allow them to drown the world of man, recreating the setting of uh, of uh, Wind Waker. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually. <laughs> oh, that would have actually been a really good par cover parody, too. But I like what we went with with the hard boiled. Yeah. The right arm of which is currently attached to Orpheus. Orpheus and Samajina are met by the Marine Investigation Unit, made up of powerful warriors trained to fight, even breathe underwater. Their leader is a powerful woman named Tomei Jinguji, who has a history with Orpheus. Chako is then kidnapped by a cultist and taken to their underwater palace, where she briefly becomes possessed by the spirit of Poseidon and is kidnapped by Kamaro. It was kind of weird that she still wore the same clothes and she became 12, but had like, yeah. we'll get into that later. That, yeah. that drawing of her was a bit strange when she matured, but not enough that it wasn't weird yeah. how mature she was. Because they were like, I think I'm 10 years old. And I'm like, you look like you're about 15. Yeah, manga ages are confusing thing <laughs> yeah kids look like an adults and adults look like kids uh <laughs> i'm actually at seven million year old sea god <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> but anyway please take us home joey Orpheus, Samejima, and the MIU follow them, where it's revealed that Kamaro and Orpheus were partners in the police who were sent to infiltrate the cult. Orpheus wound up imprisoned, and Kamaro abandoned the mission, ascending to the head of the cult. Kamaro, it turns out, is Chaco's biological father, and uh, Kamaro then bonds with the left hand... Oh, here we go. Okay, I'm going to try this. You, you do this. You got yeah. this. Yeah. I, believe in, I believe in you. I'm going to just say it first before I say the line, so Pose, pose Dracone. Pose Dracone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Kamaro then bonds with his left hand Poseidracone ah, and kills Orpheus, but Samejima fuses with Orpheus's right hand Poseidracone and defeats Kamaro before he can drown all of Earth. And he fights him when he's surfing on a giant tsunami, by the way. It's kind of sick. It's super rad. <laughs> You know, just the drawing of the tsunami on its own was super rad, and then you put a guy surfing on top of it. Very good. We'll definitely get into the art when we uh, <laughs> shift to the positives after this section. Oh, we will, yeah. And so finally, we get a little bit of a time skip. Classic <laughs> manga ending here. Ten years pass, and Chaco is now a 16-year-old girl, and Samijima is still a hard-boiled cop who raised her as her third father with a really excellent fake out where you think that he's a shark man for a moment. It was so good. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's a character that I didn't mention in the, uh, in the plot summary. I think Hamura. Yeah. 
she's showing this uh, rookie cop around and you see this big shark dude and it's sort of implied, oh my God, Samajima turned into a shark man. No, no, Samajima's just about to punch him in the face. It was great. He's just fighting a shark man that's dressed like him. <laughs> yeah, dressed exactly like him with sunglasses. I'm surprised there wasn't like a side chapter they had to a volume about the shark man stealing his clothes and that's why they're fighting. <laughs> Like, one of the best fake-outs I've seen in manga. <laughs> it's like you like this series, Jordan. It's like I like this series. What the fuck? While we're talking about the main character, Jordan, do you want to tell us a bit about the MC himself? Oh, yes. His name is Officer Boyle Samajima. And yeah, he kind of rules. He's this very stoic dude. He doesn't talk too much, but like, he's very strong, very principled. But, you know, he, he breaks the rules, does what he has to. Mm -hmm. He's a hard-boiled cop. He's a loose cannon. <laughs> what was it, BoJack Horseman, where they like had like a chart of figuring out which cop it was, and they spent like hours trying to figure out if he was like a hard-boiled cop, a loose cannon, or like a reckless <laughs> renegade? They're all the and, same. Like, cop. I just remember one of the one of the cops was voiced by Keith David, and it just made the scene really great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I love Keith David. I just wanted to add an update that people are correct. That was not Keith David. That was Cedric Yarbrough that voiced Officer Meow Meow Fuzzy Face. My sincerest apologies, Cedric. I greatly appreciate your work. But yeah, he's great. He uh, was a Tokyo cop and then he punches a dude in the face and gets sent to this Japanese island. Apparently no crime really happens on except jokes on him because it's just all underwater mafia. <laughs> His name apparently means shark. Mm -hmm, Summit. So like everybody kind of calls him shark, especially Chaco. Yeah. That's why that fake out works so well at the end, because uh, apparently the hand is what turned Orpheus into a dolphin. And now he's got the hand. So you're like, oh, my God, is he going to turn into a shark? And no. <laughs> I thought the little girl turned him into a like she like wished for him to be a dolphin. That's how. But maybe I mis misunderstood that scene. It's a little confusing. We'll get into that. <laughs> this series actually kind of had very confusing lore, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. I feel like the series had to go through a couple wreck. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll go into it in the appropriate section because we're trying to be good. Where So, Joe, we have a bad habit where we talk about pretty much 70% of the podcast occurs in this section because it's just so easy <laughs> to start talking about it. We were really good for Red Hood where we only like talked about it for like 40% instead. So I can tell Jordan's like restraining himself. And I think me too. It's hard not to just dive into these topics. But let's get through the characters and then we can start talking about why I like the series so much and yada, yada, yada. And if he was a boober, an ass guy, because that was really the big debate of this series. <laughs> the true debate. Speaking of, actually, do you guys want to get into Umi? <laughs> so Joe, Umi. Joey, would you like the pleasure of talking about her? Oh, this is the one I get, huh? Okay, sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> can give you Chaco if you want. Umi Nanase is an officer in uh, Anigashima Police, and one of her very distinctive features is that she's very well endowed, as someone would say. Oh, yes. And, uh, you know, this catches the attention of uh, Samijima, who uh, makes an ass of himself uh, staring at her all the time. But I think that cool thing about her is that she is, I don't know, she's a little bit more than just kind of a boob joke character. She she seems like a real person, <laughs> you know? Yeah. She has more of a personality. And by the end of the series, she becomes the police chief, which is cool. So yeah, I, I liked her character a lot, actually. Yeah. I do also want to say it is so refreshing to read a manga where there's a character with large breasts and she's an adult. Yeah. <laughs> there was one chapter shortly before the whole series decided to stop being a gag manga where it was just like a bunch of guys put themselves in danger because they wanted to touch yep. her breasts or something. That was probably the low point of the series. <laughs> Yeah, I honestly like kind of <laughs> reflecting back on the series. I remembered the joke where her shirt comes undone in the first chapter and been like, eh. well, at least from then, that's like the only time it's a joke. But there's lots of no. those jokes. I just kind of had forgotten them about them because by the kind of like, I don't know, halfway point, they fade away and it just becomes a lot more story focused. I personally have realized that my favorite way to say someone has large boobs comes from Resident Evil 4, where... They say the president's daughter is equipped with ballistics. Oh, I know! <laughs> I see the president has equipped his daughter with ballistics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I'll talk about Chaco, where she can talk to dolphins. She is a princess raised by dolphins, the Oracle and a cult. We find out that the main bad guy is her father. Spoilers. Her biological father, you know. Because her father's Orpheus. 
Yeah, she has three dads, which is very progressive by Shonen Jump standards, given their history with LGBT. Like, they just straight up says, I have three dads. It's great, yeah. She gets possessed by Poseidon. She doesn't do a ton, and that only happens once, which obviously the series had a premature end, but definitely there would have been a lot of potential. And it is nice that there's like a prologue where you see her actually grow up and really kind of become an adult now that she's, what, 16 or 17 during the prologue? She is an adult as far as mangaka are typically concerned, at least. Yeah, but it's nice to see her as someone with maybe a little more agency than just kind of a wild toddler (laughs) when she's not possessed by a (laughs) sea god or whatever. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then she and Yotsuba would definitely be friends. Yes. She is adorable. Like, uh, Chaco is just so cute. There's one chapter where um, she lies about breaking Orpheus's cup, and he just immediately knows that she's lying. Like, it's yeah. obvious. So he's just like, well, you know what? Uh, cup breaking gets you uh, 25 years in jail. <laughs> and she legitimately has a panic attack and, like, runs out to find uh, Samajima. It's just really cute. That's my favorite chapter. That that chapter, she like makes up this lie about like <laughs> this cartoon character on the TV is the one that stole it. And he's like, oh, really? And then she starts kind of like kind of tumbling down more and more to this lie saying like she speaks English, but she only says what's up. <laughs> And because of her powers, this ends up like manifesting and like destroying the whole apartment. This giant cartoon girl screaming was up. Uh, and it's amazing. <laughs> I think there's a line where Orpheus was like, Chaco, I was trying to find you to tell you that you weren't lying, apparently. <laughs> it's really good. Oh, God. All right. I'm going to balance things out. Joey, would you like to talk about Orpheus since I gave you the privilege of Umi, which it sounds like wasn't your cup of tea to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, so next up we have Lieutenant Orpheus F. Lipper, which what a name. So good. Love that name. A million chef kisses. (laughs) He has a dolphin head uh, and a, you know, uh, what was that? The dorsal fin and stuff on his back. Yep. Super tough. Good with kids. uh, Used to be a human, but was cursed to become this dolphin and has on top of all of that, a badass cursed right hand that he keeps under a glove. Are you familiar with Savage Dragon? Vaguely, I've read some of it. I haven't like kept up with it. For those who aren't familiar, this is this was like uh, a comic that got turned into like animated TV show when I was a kid, and it starred a big tough cop who got turned into like some weird aquatic fish creature with a giant fin on his head, and everybody called him Finhead. So they kept calling Orpheus Finhead in this, and the whole time I was just like, "Is this fucking Savage Dragon? What is going on here?" <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, all I really remember distinctly is I had the first issue when I was a kid and there's a part where like someone's hassling him at a bar and he's like, hey, do you breathe fire, Mr. Dragon? And then he like takes a sip of alcohol and then lights a lighter and spits it at the guy and it like lights up in his face and stuff. (laughs) Definitely thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen when I was 14 (laughs) in the 90s or whatever. I still think it's pretty cool. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of his fin, I love the scene where he's like lying in the bed and he's like, this is actually extremely painful for me to be sitting <laughs> like this. <laughs> this series is really funny. Yeah, I really like Orpheus a lot. Yeah, that combination of being a super tough guy, but also like very, very sweet to Chaco, just like perfect. Great balance. Exactly. Jordan, would you like the privilege of talking about his girlfriend? You mean his ex-girlfriend, David? Sorry, his ex-girlfriend. I know he's married to the sea. Well, uh, that would be Tome Jinguji, who is the head of the MIU Mm -hmm. investigation unit, I believe. Her thing is that she has learned the style of Kung Fu that allows you to breathe underwater. So like there's a big reveal where it's just like uh, she's fighting these fishmen and then she just takes out her uh, regulator and stuff and then just starts talking to them and breathing underwater and like, wait, what the fuck? And they reveal that there's like two water breathing techniques. Oh, yeah, there's two different ones. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of them, it's like you have to eat a fish man. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, that's kind of got some weird implications. So we'll just say it's unrelated. Yeah, exactly. I appreciate that, by the way, that they added that element. So it wasn't just literally every fight underwater. It's like, oh, let's take away the respirator. And then they just lose. Yeah. And it's a cool like way to do like a kind of mini training arc uh, with Sami Jima and get him to level up <laughs> somewhat. Yeah. They include enough of, uh, like, bullshit science techno babble things where they, they, it's like, you know what? I'll let you get away with it. Whatever. Fine. Mm-hmm. This is hard-boiled cop and dolphin. <laughs> 
<laughs> the next character I'll take that duty on is a Saria, who is the ocean princess looking for a man. She shows up and then she kind of disappears for like 30 chapters. I actually deleted her name from the character section and then had to add it back. She is a double agent, but actually she is a triple agent. Whoa, where she's yeah. kind of evil, but not. The author kind of was running out of time. So he's like, yeah, fuck it. She is very clearly a character that the author, when he wrote her, did not intend for her to be like this, to be in this situation. (laughs) She was a one off joke. It definitely is end of manga syndrome where he needed to fit a character in for a role because he never introduced it. Yeah, there was like all this stuff with her, like passed down in the like undersea kingdom or something. And it's like starting to like hint at this bigger world that they never really got to. There's an entire city that they show, but then they never go to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like her dad was, uh, is like one of the most powerful mafia guys in the ocean, apparently. Yep. And he was like dying, but he was like, oh, he's a criminal with a heart of gold. But oh man, this, uh, the next character in our list comes over and is like, oh, I'm a doctor. I could save her. But he winds up, he's the cult leader guy. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. That's really all there is to say about her. Yeah. She doesn't do much. But you know who does too much is the big bad. So, Joey, why don't you wrap up this character section talking about him? Okay, that is Yosuke Kamuro. And this guy is, yeah, like you said, the big bad. Uh, he's the leader of the cult. Uh, we find out that he's Chaco's dad. And he used to be Orpheus's partner back when Orpheus was a human. <laughs> he's a sex pest. He's such a sex pest. He surrounds himself with beautiful women and has that sort of cult leader thing where, you know, he likes to have the power. He's just there talking with one of his uh, underlings, I suppose, named Okiura mm-hmm. or something. And they're just having a conversation. And he's just groping her ass. Yeah. To be fair, the next panel is her putting him in like a wrestling move for doing that. And they're still just having a casual conversation. I think that's sort of a wrestling move that perhaps she thinks that he would appreciate. Oh, yeah. You mean where she put her ass on his head? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I noticed that. I absolutely noticed that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this is not a good dude. He's an awful dude. He, we find out, you know, that he beats his wife and kids and everything. It, it's pretty rough. So, like, any thought that it might be like, oh, this beautiful anime man might actually be sympathetic by the end. No, he's a bad guy for sure. Yeah. Do you think they planned for him to be like this? We'll talk about it later. I I think that maybe the road to getting there was pretty like accelerated, but I think all that stuff with his past with Orpheus and stuff, I think read to me like something the author had from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It never felt super jarring. There's a moment where it seems like his his brain was kind of broken when he found out that the former guru of the cult developed breathing underwater by cannibalizing uh, fishmen. Mm -hmm. And that just really fucked him up. And so he decided instead to band with the fishmen. I don't know if it's Japanese myth or if it's just from uh, Rumiko Takahashi's comics, but like there's this idea that if you eat a mermaid, you would get eternal life. I kind of wondered if that came from that sort of idea as what the author was playing with, with the eating a fishman thing. That makes sense. And now that we've really gone into the characters, why don't we migrate over into why it failed? So, Joey, what would you really say is something that stuck out to you that the series really didn't do so well? The thing I always think about with this series is that first chapter. It's pretty rough. Yeah. Especially bad just due to timing. Mm -hmm. And this might be more of an issue with American readers. I couldn't say for sure. But like this chapter debuted right at the height of the Black Lives Matter protests and all the issues with around that. And then there's this first chapter like trivializes this issue and almost like glorifies police for like acting outside of the law and and using firearms against uh, these darn kids and their camera phones, you know. And I don't think that Tamara was necessarily referencing that specific incident because these chapters are written well ahead of time. Mm -hmm. It really didn't sit right with a lot of readers that I knew. Like, I remember when this came out at the time, a lot of people saying, like, I'm not going to read any more of this. It's, you know, copaganda or whatever. And I could not blame it. No, me neither. The premise was fun enough. And there were enough little inklings that it was like still worth reading that I pushed forward with it and ended up really loving it. But Mm -hmm. boy, that first chapter Woof. <laughs> yeah, that uh, copaganda is not great. Even like well done copaganda is still copaganda. Like as we talked about Die Hard, total copaganda, even if it's a really fun movie. And yeah, that first chapter, he must have gotten notes because he toned those elements down super duper hard. Mm-hmm. I was very worried after that first chapter and I'm really grateful. 
Yeah, I, I think guns are only used maybe two or three times in the entire series after that first chapter. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I really noticed about the series was to get into like the first chapters, it doesn't really set up anything and it starts off as a slice of life. And then just by mm-hmm. chapter 15, he's like, let's just go full plot. Let's make things interesting where I think we've really noticed is that these gag mangas, when they start having like a really strong plot, that's really when the series starts to get in trouble. Like Matama security, when it stopped being so gag based and tried having a plot, we were just like, if I wanted to read like a really strong plot with deep lore that's not why i'm reading this and that's why i like high school family so much is yeah it's got kind of plots but they're all gag plots and it's like i'm not really worried about finding out that gomez is you know like the reincarnation (laughs) of an ancient cat god (laughs) he's just a fucking cat that goes to high school and that's how he's been for the last 50 chapters and that's all he needs to be until he graduates i do think he should run for high school president well yeah (laughs) sorry but joey you were saying I recall feeling that way with Mitama where like they do like a baseball arc or something and I'd be kind of like, all right, I'm going to just sit this through and eventually we're going to get back to the good like one off chapters because yeah, they just kind of it seems like the jokes kind of go by the wayside and some gag authors don't write very strongly without all those gags, you know, and this one's kind of a little bit different, but I I really like the sort of lackadaisical first several chapters. Uh, I like the mood a lot in it. Um, I know that's not what we're talking about right now, but like I can see why it wouldn't necessarily hook a lot of people i think that the editor came up to this author and said look man you gotta do something (laughs) which is what i I think happens in a lot of these gag mangas like i mean i think that's why it happened in mashal too why mashal suddenly Mm. switched like high school family i think is strong enough as a gag manga I've heard that there's like a rule for gag manga where you're not technically a gag manga in the purest sense if you're over 15 pages consistently. Like if you notice that High School Family is actually about 15 pages every single chapter, and I guess that's like the rule of it. Well, this series from the get-go was doing standard chapter length. Yeah, these days Jump has a lot more gag manga in it uh, at a time. It used to be that mm-hmm. there was just like one or two and they would be like strictly right in the back of the magazine. It was kind of its own little world. And mm-hmm. now they kind of like cohabitate with the rest of the series a lot more. The uh, line between what is a gag manga and what's an action manga and what's a romance manga and what's a sports manga is all like kind of like <laughs> meshing together, <laughs> which I think is cool. Because really, in terms of pure, pure gag manga, High School Family is 100% gag. And then mm-hmm. Roboco, right? Are yeah. those, Is there other ones that are, you would say, are just... Magu-chan, I would say, is a oh, gag manga. Oh, right, Magu-chan. Yeah, but Magu-chan's going through the same thing where now they have like a big plot. And it's just, it's not as fun. Oh, There's some man. fun jokes in it, but it, this is definitely not peak Magu-chan. Like, yeah. I want them to go back to building, you know, a fucking treehouse. That was yeah. great. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> It's really tough to make that transition because you are basically taking this huge jump into like a a very different style or approach to writing. It's really tough to pull off. Yeah. I also feel like in terms of the writing, sometimes the jokes can be lazy. Like I know it's like a cornerstone of Japanese and like even One Piece does it, but that whole the joke is a character reacting to someone doing something stupid is just such a lazy joke that you I know you can get mileage out of it. But like I just saw like every single chapter that was like the punchline to at least one joke. Is yeah, somebody like, screaming out like, why did you do that thing or whatever, that kind of thing? You're like, that doesn't make any sense. You're like, that's not how you wear a hat. Mm-hmm. It's different jokes, but the same punchline. It's not even different jokes. It's explaining the previous joke that you just saw. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting. That's a Japanese style of comedy that sometimes works for me and sometimes is too stiff. I don't know. It just depends. Yeah. Like it often would work for me here, but I could totally see what you mean. It reminds me of the Austin Powers uh, joke where it's like you have this guy with a thick Irish accent and he's like, I got me lucky charms here. And then you just have like Dr. Evil's girlfriend just being like, <laughs> it's like the cereal guy. And he's like, what's the cereal? Guy? Oh, you know, there's a lucky charm cereal. And I'm just like, dude, I get it. I, I know the joke here. Yeah. Mike Myers was a fan of that sort of over explaining the joke. <laughs> joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One thing that I think doesn't super work well for this series is that I think Chaco's powers are kind of confusing. Yeah. They say that she creates these creatures, but then there are also fish men hybrids that I think exist independently of that. Yeah. But they are also kind of like they say that they're drawn to her and it's like, okay, so is she making them? Is she not making them? Is she attracting them? It's kind of both. And, you know, I think this kind of mysterious nature is not necessarily bad as a rule but it does make it hard to like latch on to and very easily like give one somebody like you know an elevator pitch of like this is this girl and these are her powers you know 
it really did at least seem initially like, oh, this was just a normal world. And then Chaco showed up and now we have these weird hybrids and stuff. And then it just built out this whole history. Yeah. Like at first when Orpheus was talking about the mafia, the underwater mafia, I thought he was talking about like real fish just like getting <laughs> in like uh, these mafia situations. <laughs> where, so it's like you would just see this dolphin going around pushing these sea urchins around. And that was an example of policing Then I found out. Oh, no, he's literally talking about fishmen mafia okay yeah <laughs> that sounds like a fucking ska band fishmen Fish mafia <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah do you guys have any other negatives that you really want to make sure we talk about yeah this is not uh, necessarily an issue that i have with the manga personally i think it's actually cool but i wouldn't be sur- surprised if a reason why it didn't catch on with the intended audience you know teens is mm-hmm. that they might not have much interest in a story about two adult men taking care of a toddler that is true as well And it's not even that much of a focal point. It's kind of like an excuse plot for why they have hijinks. Mm, Yeah. To be honest, I was not expecting what this series turned into from the title. I was not expecting what this series turned into from the promotional material. Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking at the Shonen Jump app and I'm looking for, oh, what kind of series do I want to read next? Hardboiled Cop and Dolphin? That looks dumb. I don't want to check that out. It just doesn't do the series any favors. Yeah. The last thing I want to say is I also feel like there's really no agency to the female characters. Like, there's not really any character depth or growth. Like, Umi is completely pointless besides gags because she doesn't really have a purpose in the post gag manga series. There's a lot of side characters. Like, there's that guy with the eye patch that is I'm always kind of like, when is he going to do something? Eh, nothing. Never really. (laughs) Yeah. We haven't even mentioned uh, Chaco's mom at all. And she's like a huge part of like towards the end, but she doesn't really do anything like personally. She is she's a victim to the point where I was actually very confused in the last chapter as to whether or not she was dead or whether or not she yeah. was a character like uh, like there's a character that was talking to Samajima at the very end. And it seemed to imply that, no, that is Chaco's mom. She just has a different hairstyle. But I couldn't tell because Chaco's talking about he like, yeah, I talked to my mom and I'm I'm just like, wait, where is she? Did I, did I like, like miss something here? That's a story for another day, reader. <laughs> Hard-boiled uh, shark in frog and <laughs> dolphin Casey Green production. <laughs> Though, you know, Casey Green also very based. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. I'm really showing my age. But speaking of things that are based, why don't we get into the positives where fellow based person Joey is going to tell us some of the reasons why he wanted us to cover the series for this episode. Well, first of all, I just love the setting. Like, I think the tropical remote island uh, has just a lot of like great vibes. And it's nice to have a series <laughs> set in Japan, but not the usual Tokyo or Kyoto locations. If anything, this series has a very creative idea. I mean, there's one series in Shonen Jump that I likewise would compare it to, and I'll talk about that in the miscellaneous thoughts. We're deciding what series I would most want to do a crossover with the series. But yeah, like, it's just fun. I It's got some cool science facts, too. Kind of abandons it later on, but at least at the start, I was learning a little bit, and then they get, like, he kind of gives up, and he just makes fake science, which is a little disappointing, but still, science, all the same. I enjoy Dr. Stone, if you can't tell. I mean, David, there has to be a point where when you're talking about a guy with a dolphin's head, Like, there's no real science way to explain that is what I'm trying to get to. You just have to have a very, like, light sprinkling of science that, like, passes a sniff test. Don't research this, but does it sound okay? (laughs) (laughs) Just say words where I'm like, well, I'm not smart enough to understand that anyway. So sure, whatever. Yeah, that probably works. I really liked this series way more than I thought I was going to. Uh Oh, yeah, I had a great time reading it. The art was really good. Like, it it was more subtle than a lot of other work. Like, uh, Phantom Seer, people always talk about how great Phantom Seer's art is. Blah, I don't fucking, I don't care. Like, they didn't have these huge, gross, like, grotesque monsters. They're just, like, incredible composition. Like, amazing uh, layouts. There's one panel where um, Hamura is trying to help another character. And that character, like, gets her leg cut off and stuff. And just the panel that that was, was like... Like, composed like a classical painting. It was just so well done. It was very, it told a whole story with like emotions and stuff just in like this one image. I was really blown away. Yeah, yeah. Tamara has a real like mastery of comics, that's for sure. Like, the pacing and the art and everything is like kind of pitch perfect. It feels like the art, the thing that struck me about it, I haven't read Beelzebub and I'd only read, I think Viz only published like the first three chapters of Hungry Murray. And so I'm not really familiar with him, but it, 
like felt kind of old like it felt kind of like an 80s or 90s series or something yeah but that's like appealing to me and it's just so like refined but like you said subtle like he doesn't really mm-hmm. hit you over the head with it but when you really look at it you're just like damn that's some really amazing work right there you know that's some fucking art <laughs> you know what it is he has restraint mm-hmm. yes I think it's because also the time budget kind of works in his favor where he has kind of an uh, like a A style where, you know, he does like two or three pages where it's really, really well drawn and detailed. And then he has that B style where it's much lighter. And I think it really works for the difference in tones as well. Yeah. I also want to say I really like the use of like when he does that really intense black shading. It's so good. Yeah. That's such a great tut taste or touch. And it really does add a cinematic element. And I kind of actually do wish sometimes that the art really felt like it was more cinematic or like shot like a movie, which, it, you know, like is supposed to be a reference, at least in the title. But I guess it's the English title, so it's not fair to compare. But that would have been cool if he had done more kind of cinematic style, uh, making it feel like it's a movie. Mm hmm. You mentioned that black shading. There's like one panel where like all these dolphins are just like uh, jumping through the air and they're all drawn like pitch black. And it's like, yeah, really intense and like really cool looking. Like I was Mm -hmm. just absolutely blown away by some of the stuff in this. And there's a really great use of screen tones as well. Like amazing. I got really obsessed with the way that anytime he would sort of depict like palm trees, like the shadows of of the palm trees and stuff uh, that he just did with screen tone alone, just was really awesome looking. And uh, yeah, there's like a really great panel of uh, Orpheus like rolling down his window while he's in the car. And like, yeah, there's different <laughs> screen tones, like where the windows roll down versus where the window overlaps him. And it's oh, man, it's so good. He just really knows how these tools work. Mm hmm. I mean, this is a guy who already had a big success, and you can tell he really knows, and he's not like Build King where he just kind of was coasting on his success. This guy put just as much effort into the series as I assume he would he put in his first series that made it big. Yeah, you know, and along those lines, like, I think that really feeds into a thought that I have when I read this about the ending being so good. Like, the ending is really good, and it feels, like, as natural as it can Mm -hmm. due to time constraints. And, you know, I can tell that it kind of came into the story earlier than he had intended, but it still pretty much works. And I think that's because of one of two possibilities being at play here, is that either Tamara, having had a hit series in the past, had a little bit more wiggle room with editorial, and Maybe they gave him an earlier heads up that his series was eventually going to be canceled or even kind of like told him, hey, you've only got, you know, so much time Mm -hmm. or just, you know, him being a veteran author at this point, he was able to see the writing on the wall at some point and he could track his own sales and his own position in the magazine just as well as anybody else, you know, on Twitter is doing and was probably able to be like, okay, this is not going to be forever, you know, and was able to start really seeding this end ending a lot faster than, you know, that kind of like fan speculation that authors have about three chapters left after they're told that they're canceled. Who knows how uh, correct that is, but like that is around the time that you start seeing authors really scrambling to wrap things up. And here he just kind of like really smoothly, like just slides on into the ending. It's amazing how satisfying like the final confrontation be- between Samajima and Kamaro is where punches him with the fucking Orpheus's severed arm while he's yeah. <laughs> surfing on a tidal wave. Like that kicks ass. <laughs> and it, it thematically worked. Like the thing that I'm just so blown away by with this series is that it had that sudden crazy genre shift, which is something I haven't seen in a while. Like the sudden just tonal complete change, but it, it stuck the land ending somehow yeah. <laughs> it wound up becoming better i was absolutely <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it like i'm kind of in awe of this series of just what he somehow pulled off there's very clearly stuff he did where he, he had to retcon he had to do things where it's like well he wasn't planning that when he introduced that character but he, i think he pulls it off like shockingly well i agree i feel like he must have had like at least like 10 plus chapters where he knew Because there's a lot of things he did that he could not have done if he had only three chapters to finish the series. Yeah, I think authors like him and Kishimoto get a little bit more uh, time to kind of fail in the magazine, I guess is a good way to put it, where they're like, yeah, you know, we're not going to cancel you immediately. But just so you know, this has to wrap up. 
Yeah, Samurai 8 went like maybe 20 chapters long here than it would have <laughs> under normal circumstances. Yeah. yeah. Oh, one thing that we haven't discussed is this art. The series actually has post arc like cooldown scenes, which I think, Jordan, we talked about is one of the best things Chainsaw Man does where they just are hanging out, being friends. Yeah. And they have an idea where, yes, the series gets very intense and it isn't really the direction I want to go. But he goes back to his roots in between those big arcs. And I really appreciate that you just are seeing him be like a really low stakes adventure or him just hanging out with our cops and being buddies. And that really added a lot of depth, which these characters definitely need as we talked about the why failed section because these characters don't have a lot of depth unless they're the focus of the story. Yeah. As a result of that, you get some like really great moments between just uh, like Chaco and Orpheus or Orpheus and Samajima or Samajima and Chaco. Like you just get like these really great moments of them just kind of hanging out and having this dynamic. Yeah, it really endears you to the characters. And I feel like it was very telling when you get to the last chapter and the chapter title page is just like kind of a big panel of them all, like all the characters basically hanging out together and smiling. Yeah. And I just like felt like, oh, this is nice. There they all are, you know, and a lot of times you see those kinds of drawings and you're just kind of like, okay, yeah, there's everybody. But uh, (laughs) this one hit me a little bit more. Oh, and it reminds me of the end of Matama. Yeah. So speaking of uh, Matama, where that series also had a lot of potential and uh, unfortunately was taken away from us too soon, why don't we shift gears and really talk about where we really would have hoped the series could have gone? As far as where it could have gone, I think it basically ended the way that he intended, but I think that we Mm -hmm. would have had more adventures with various sea creature people, villains, and things like that before we got to that final arc. You know, really build up those undersea, that undersea world, like we'd mentioned, we wanted to see that kingdom or city or whatever that the, Mm -hmm. that's rife with fish Yakuza or whatever. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'd love to see more of those characters because even the ones that we started to get, like uh, that guy that's like, what was he, like a swordfish or something? And yeah. And, uh, Hammerhead shark guy, those guys are really cool, and I was really looking forward to seeing more characters like that. I completely forgot about the hammerhead shark guy. I love the hammerhead shark guy. <laughs> yeah, he came back for like two panels and then got his arm cut off. Yeah. <laughs> He's a hammerhead shark, but no, his head is literally a hammer. Like, it's not a hammerhead shark. Like, he just has a hammer in his hair. It's great. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just think I think that and then regarding the ending, like I think a lot of the characters and ideas and maybe even parts of that flashback that were introduced in the final arc would have been sprinkled throughout several arcs rather than all crammed together in one. Yeah. And then how about you, Jordan? I definitely would have liked to have seen more of the underwater mafia. Mm-hmm. I think if it had kept going, like uh, we probably would have gotten maybe a little bit more with uh, the MIU, the uh, Marine Investigations Unit, find out a little bit more about them and their backstory. They could have been like one of the billions of factions that are in Bleach, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, he does that thing where he introduces like this big double page spread where he's like, here are, you know, eight or nine new characters and then basically only one of them ever participates in the story. Story of our lives. Yeah. <laughs> oh, speaking of someone that I wish had participate in the story, I really, I really was hoping they were going to make a Jotaro reference. Because, you know, he became a marine biologist <laughs> and he studied dolphins. So I really, really was hoping that they would have a Jojo parody. It's true. Wait, was it this series where it was like... Uh, this little kid was like, I have a turtle, I named it Polnareff. That's great. But I just want to imagine if he just showed up and did like a time stop (laughs) to save the day and just disappeared again. He was like, dolphins are so interesting. But more realistically, I really would have liked to have seen the daughter play at the more possession by Poseidon thing, where especially if they had her age up more or fighting this and forging her own identity and dealing with the fact that she's kind of like a soft reincarnation of a god, but she's her own person. Kind of, you know, like how Avatar Last Airbender does that, where, you know, it's like a soft reincarnation where, yes, technically he's reincarnated, but he's still definitely his own person. Yeah, I, I mean, and I also definitely would like to see uh, the mom play a larger part in the story because I'm still very confused as to, like, everything ar- around her and yeah. what she does. Who is she? Is she dead? Is she, like, secretly in the police? Yeah. It's it's a little confusing the way that they end that all up. Yeah, you'll have to read that in uh, Hard Boiled or Cop and Dolphin, the sequel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He just does the thing that, like, uh, the Build King author does, where it's like, "Uh uh-oh, get the Build King volume so you can read the actual end of this series. I wasn't canceled. (laughs) What the fuck are you talking about, man? (laughs) Hey, man, if this guy wanted to put out some volume-exclusive stories, I would totally get that. (laughs) Oh, yeah. 
I mean, I look forward to the next series. But yeah, and then uh, are you guys cool to go to miscellaneous thoughts? Yeah. So though, I think now that we've really talked about where it could have gone, which actually is shorter than usual, because really the series really did a fantastic job of living up to a lot of its potential. Let's talk about some miscellaneous thoughts and maybe some cool science facts. I know, Joey, you have a degree in marine biology, much like Joe Taro, so I'd really love to hear about kind of how accurate the series was. And I'm not just totally putting him on the spot. I'm sure he's frantically looking up cool dolphin facts right now on Google. <laughs> <laughs> Through my research, I have learned that dolphins do in fact live in the sea. Damn, that's why we come. That's why people listen to Shonen Whoa. Flop. For, yeah, science, bitch. <laughs> So, though, I'll kick things off. There are so many crossovers that I think this series could have had. Do you guys have any one series if you were like, if they could have done like a one chapter crossover, you know, like how TBZ and One Piece had one? What would you guys pick? Well, Savage Dragon. <laughs> yeah. For, for a manga, you silly goose. Oh, uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles manga. I hate you. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Shonen Jump manga. Um... <laughs> I can think of two really strong candidates. Uh, Mitama Security Spirit Busters, I guess. Oh, that wasn't on my list. How about you, Joey? Kochi Kame, the policeman who works on a certain block or whatever. That was the guy with the big, thick eyebrows that was kind of Jump's mascot for so many years. Didn't it run for like 50 years or something? 200 volumes. Nice. Yeah, I think it's not quite as long as Gogo 13, That's maybe. That's the assassin one, right? Yeah, but it's definitely the longest running series in Jump, even excluding JoJo's, which is like arguably multiple series. But yeah, so my pick is I would have gone with Mora King or I Tell C. And I was surprised you didn't mention I Tell C. Oh, yeah, I Tell C. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Yeah, they would have gone along super well. Uh, Joey, are you familiar with I Tell C? I read the first couple chapters of that one. <laughs> I really like it. David really doesn't. Yeah, I'm more with David on that one. <laughs> Most people agree with me. You know, they're wrong. It's OK. This is literally has the same energy as Mora King during the first 14 chapters. A little bit more horny than Mora King. True. This is a miscellaneous thought. The author is such an ass man. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. He tries to show boobs, but we knew, like, he definitely put more effort in the ass shots. Got a lot of focus there, especially with uh, the head of the MIU. Like, for, like, the second half of the series, she's just in a wetsuit, and constantly you just see her from, like, a low angle from the back. <laughs> yeah, there's also that woman that works at the aquarium, too, right? The, oh, um... yeah. Plenty of time he's got a woman in a wetsuit. You're going to see yeah. that ass. <laughs> hey, but at least they're all over 18. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> there's like one, there's fuck, there's like one uh, page or, or one, um, one chapter cover, one title page where it's uh, Nanase and Chaco just chilling out, floating in the pool. Yo. <laughs> Chaco's stomach is like floating over the water, but just Nanase's boobs are just floating up right. <laughs> the water. Like. <laughs> Speaking of boobs, this I feel like this is the series that the Build King guy wishes he had made, where you know it has like it's pretty much I think the style of humor Build King was trying to do and plot and just not shitting itself at every single possible opportunity. Hmm. I know there's a lot of series that I would have rather had been written instead of Build King. That's true, yeah. <laughs> we could have had a good manga publish in the spot of the like 25 pages, 25 chapters that series took up. I could have read something different, yeah. Yeah, we were we we're making our like panel art where it's like me and Jordan was surrounded by Shonen Jump stuff and they're like, should we have a reference to Build King? I was like, I, no. No. Yeah, that's fine. We can just uh, not put that in the spotlight anymore. <laughs> out of sight, out of mind. I'm glad that she's adding the rugby JPEG from Beast Children. Oh, good. Thank God. Joey, for context, uh, one of the first series we read, uh, Beast Children, is like something that's, it's like a hilariously bad uh, rugby manga. And mm. every time they have a, the rugby ball, it is the same JPEG of a rugby ball, just <laughs> sized up and turned in order to fit whatever angle they're at. It's so bad. It looks awful. It looks so bad. It's great. Yeah, if you Google image search something once, why do it again? Exactly. <laughs> why draw many things when one draw do good? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, do you guys have any other miscellaneous thoughts? Uh, yeah, I have a few. Oh, um, go for it, Joey. Yeah, this comic, especially the color pages, really gave me some mm -hmm. huge city pop vibes. Yeah. And I'd say perfect uh, to listen to or to read while listening to Tatsuro Yamashita, those kind of beachy vibes. 
<laughs> Not Beechy vibes, Beechy. Oh, no, no. <laughs> One of the reasons I think that this might have appealed to me is that Chaco reminds me a lot of a Raleigh from Dr. Slump. I could see that, yeah. One of my favorite characters is she's Chaco's kind of carrying on this legacy of cheery faced agents of chaos, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, something that I really wish that the series had done a little bit differently, I guess this could have gotten in that section, but I wish that when we saw Hey Baro, the, the dolphin, uh, you know, um, Orpheus's, Orpheus's real name. human form, that he was like a big guy like Orpheus is. He was just a cute anime guy. Yeah, that was kind of disappointing to me. I don't know. I think this series would have been a huge pain in the ass to animate because they would have had to animate like all that water because they can't just be lazy because it's the focus of the series. Oh, yeah. Hello, computer generated beaches. Speaking of anime, like definitely been thinking about looking up the uh, Beelzebub anime because like I'd love to see this guy's like big hit series, you know. Now that we're talking about some successes uh, when talking about Beelzebub, why don't we get into our final verdict? Let's start things off, as always, with some of the awesome fan submitted six word summaries. We actually have quite a few listeners from the Discord listening in, so they're going to hear me talk about it. Their six word summary in real time, yeah, so that's pretty that's exciting. Fun, yeah. First of all, we got Chimmy Chems, not cop drama, just ocean fighting. And then we got Generic Man, who bugs by my school of cheating the six word count with H2O, just add combat. <laughs> <laughs> D. Wolfwood, hi T. Wolfwood, says poorly timed comedy is hard boiled dolphin. Uh, he did hyphenate it, so if you're counting, yes, that counts as six words. Nice. <laughs> Agpa says jurisdiction 20,000 leagues under the sea. T. Root says Yakuza, like a dolphin on PS5. Aussie Rat says Waterworld Buddy Cop Romance for the Ages. I actually haven't seen Waterworld, I need to. Do you need to? I almost mentioned that when you were talking about the Zelda game. <laughs> Chaco does look like the little girl in that. That movie might have been an influence on this manga, actually. Oh, for sure. <laughs> more Interesting. It, yeah. <laughs> uh, Meowth says Dolphin was cute. Cop was sexy. Meowth would think that the cop was sexy. Yeah. The question is, when is Meowth not in horny jail, to be honest? Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Victor says the cops are going to be busted. And apparently this is like an obscure reference to a children's show I actually watched called Funky Cops. But I just want to explain it because, yeah, uh, Victor is definitely working on a level I was not when he wrote it. First off, I just have to say, Tucker, holy shit, man, you're a fucking machine. You just fucking killing it. David, read Tucker's six word summary. I know. Tucker said, what if God was one porpoise? Very good. We're going to have the best six word summary from Tucker because it's just not going to be fair when we do the Shonen Flop Awards. <laughs> All right. So, Joey, what was yours? I have a couple here. Oh, go for it. First of all, a hard-boiled cop and a dolphin. The title says it all. <laughs> this is, I've never seen someone say this title of the series as their six word summary. It's a pretty good summary, honestly. That's pretty great. That's pretty great. <laughs> You know, contrary to what we were saying earlier, the title does give you at least an idea of what you're getting into. Yeah. And then that final chapter where she's talking about her three dads, you know, this one's for the Tom Selleck fans or the Gutenbergers out there. Three men and a little lady. Oh, that's nice. How about you, Jordan? Like hot fuzz at SeaWorld. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right. I also had two. So tell me which one of you guys like it more. My first one was Goofs, Gags, and Tiggle Biddies. The second one was The Life Aquatic with John Woo. Second one's better. Yeah, that's definitely better. <laughs> I just want to say tickle bitties on the show. I know you did. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the one who assigned Umi to me. That was your big chance. But I, Well, I wanted to give you the privilege. <laughs> the big privilege. The two big privileges. All right. I think we're all pretty in alignment. So, the Joey, was this a flop or not? No. How about you, Jordan? No, not at all. No. Holy shit, no. <laughs> no, not me. Joey, I don't... Have you read Chainsaw Man? Yeah. All right. Well, I think you might be the first guest that's read Chainsaw Man, if memory serves. So would you say this is better or worse than Chainsaw Man? No, I, you know, Chainsaw Man just feels so personal, you know, mm -hmm. to that artist, whereas this feels very specific to this artist. I know that's like kind of like a fine differentiation, but like I really felt the, the author of Chainsaw Man pouring himself into it in a way that this maybe feels a little more distanced from the author. I get that. Uh, yeah. So I'd say in that way, Chainsaw Man, uh, you know, takes the lead. <laughs> oh, yeah. How about you, Jordan? Chainsaw Man's still better. No, no doubt. Kind of asked that question as a joke, but the real question is, Jordan, is this the best one we've ever read? Fuck, this is tough. It might be. It, I don't know if it, it's, it's fucking up there, man. Like, <laughs> is this better than Mora King? Mora King's your number one. 
Well, it's just Mora King. Mora King is the same, like Mora King or Time Paradox genre. Ghost Rider. Uh, right. This might be though. It's tough. I might put this above Mora King, and I might even put it above Time Paradox Ghost Rider. It's been a long time since I've read that. Ooh. Jordan's like gonna go for a walk. <laughs> yeah. I know this is not for me, but I I liked Time Paradox Ghost Rider, but I would put this above it personally. We're just not used to the guests having like read the other canceled series. We have oh, so sorry. sorry. That's why I didn't ask you. No, no, I love it. I love that uh, when guests actually have read some of the series that we've covered. Yeah, I think the problem with me is that I really wouldn't change anything about Time Paradox Ghost Rider. Like similarly, like he saw the writing on the wall so fast that he really made a very comprehensive story. This series has a lot of dead weight and a lot of things that just didn't work. And it's not like if you read it, you're going to say it's great for what it was. Well, Time Paradox Ghost Rider is just like a very good series and it being mm. canceled didn't change any of the quality of the series like jordan we talked about it. you couldn't have made time paradox ghost rider longer than it was yeah and that's why i think it's better now i'm gonna have to think about it more but like right now it's vi- it's up there all right well how about this versus mora king i'd say this is better than mora king i think so too yeah listeners at some point jordan's gonna have to circle back and make his decision <laughs> that was actually how we found out about Stephen paul i think i dm'd him about it and we're like we read the series in your translator or something and he was like telling us facts about the series which was really cool and that's how we started talking to him yeah, I remember when he was translating that, and I remember <laughs> messaging with him about like how crazy it was and how fast everything was moving, and he w- <laughs> really wouldn't say much back to me because he couldn't, you know. Yeah. His mind, he was just like, yeah, that's because it's ending. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some series you can really, really tell when they're about to end. Yeah, but that one was moving at that speed from chapter one. So that's like... the thing. That's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> that's like, there was nothing I would have changed. I don't, Time Paris Ghost Rider could not have lasted 50 chapters. Like, it, it doesn't feel like somebody told him you have three chapters to wrap it up. Yeah. It feels like he had this goal in mind of ending it at this chapter. Jordan, now that you've had a little bit of time, yes or no, you got to snap judgment. You got to make your call now. You can always retcon it later when we have the big talk in May. But for now, where does it stand? It's better than Time Paradox Ghost Rider. Boom. <laughs> oh, man. Next time we read something good, we're going to have a complicated conversation. We've never been split on this before. Oh, man. You are here to see it, Joey. Man, history in the making. I feel honored. Damn. <laughs> it's been 30, or what, 30 episodes since we, or 50, 20 episodes since we've seriously had a contender for best series we've ever read. See, not even mad you made us read something really long because it was worth it. tough, yeah. Nice. What a relief. No, no, no. This was a fucking beachy scenario. I would have been really pissed. I was actually thinking of beachy because there's some instances where the dude just, he just didn't draw the faces very well and they kind of look like beachy characters. <laughs> I had that in my notes. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, now we're talking about other things. Why don't we migrate to shout outs? Props to Jordan for making the opening ending theme and being a great co-host and helping with the editing. Props to Mer Lai for her awesome cover art. You can find her online at Lyle Mer and Nigel for being a generous art benefactor. Thanks to Tucker for assistance with pronunciation, translation, other miscellaneous research and fucking just flexing so hard with those six word summaries. I swear to God, I don't understand how you're so good at them. <laughs> <laughs> you really should work in ad copy. Thanks to Nicole for helping with social media and thanks to Luke for being our community producer. He does a lot of really awesome stuff. He helps arrange game nights. He runs our book club. We're having a really exciting book club where we're actually crossing over off on our Discord. I'm going to be in Italy so I'm going to have to get up at 2am for that because I didn't realize when we scheduled it and it was too late to change it. So that'll be really fun to hear Delirious David at 2am in uh, Milan. And though on that note of speaking of great people, I want to give a big shout out to Dylan and Sean from Anime Out of Context, a little known podcast they just have about mm, 40 times the listeners we do, <laughs> but they don't let the fame get to their head. Dylan, absolute rocks are really helpful. He's actually helping me figure out better uh, editing strategies for the audio. Likewise, if you feel like you know a finger to about audio editing, please send me a message uh, or Gmail or Twitter or or on Discord. I really love improving my task. I have it all in an audio guide, so I love to share the knowledge as well. And Sean also just being an awesome dude to talk to, and he was a super big help, along with the community, in picking series that we should reference in our upcoming chibi art. Shannon is still working on it. There's just a big labor of love. We wanted her to do it as her magnum opus. We have like 30 different references. We'll put it up. It's going to be a lot of fun just figuring them all out. <laughs> some series you know, some you don't. Um, some I wasn't aware of, and Shannon said, put it in. I said, sure, why not? So I actually don't know every reference in that yeah. wall, so that's part of the fun yeah david i would like to thank you for being such a based editor thank you my acid co-host because that's the opposite of a base is is an acid Uh, whatever
<laughs> some of that science yeah science bitch uh, I've said that so many times good thing I can swear on my podcast speaking of uh, things I'm allowed to do you should be sure to join the Shonen Flop Discord come hang out with us and talk about anime games or whatever else is on your mind we also have a book club as I've talked about that's run by the lovely Luke and do regular movie nights up next we are going to be watching Dread the 2012 one super awesome it was a really close poll we put it up against Hard Boiled and Blade Runner so awesome movies it's always a lot of fun and uh, you can find a link to it in our show notes and if you've been enjoying the podcast and want to help us keep going, consider subscribing to our Patreon. We have a ton of awesome perks ranging from exclusive mini episodes, deleted scenes, and you can even help us pick what series we're going to cover next. Find it at patreon.com slash flop. On that note, I want to give a shout out to Pterodactyl Ghost for being a Chainsaw Man patron and T. Wolfwood, Marty, Gay, Mark, Overrated Apples, Matt, Albie, some of whom are listening right now for being King of the Forest, speaking of Mora King. And if you're not ready for a regular commitment, consider buying some merch. We have a ton of awesome designs, including the art for this episode and the Gomez Moon and Matchle Punching Harry Potter. Potter shirts and a portion of the proceeds go back to the original artist. And no worries, so if you can't help the show out financially, if you could just tell a friend about our show, really, it would mean to the bottom of my heart. You know, organic reach is so important, and we're we're so excited about the amount of growth we've seen in the year and a half. And it's just awesome to have people be like, "Oh yeah, I, uh, I actually met someone who heard about my show from a different friend of mine, and that was just really great." So it really does make my day when someone shares our show. But you know who else I'm extremely thankful for is, of course, someone who is extremely based, Joey. Joey, just thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show. Where can they find all the awesome things that you are doing in your world? Thanks again for having me on. You can find me at Joey Weiser on Twitter or Joey Weiser Comics on Instagram. Mm -hmm. The Instagram is a little bit more focused on just my art uh, and work. I am a cartoonist, whereas my Twitter is a bit more all over the place about like uh, comics I'm reading, movies I'm watching, things like Mm -hmm. that. Please check out my graphic novels. Uh, Like I mentioned, uh, my newest book is called Dragon Racer. And uh, the book before that was called Ghost Hog. And I also did a five volume series called Merman that are available digitally as well as in print love these titles is, is that about ethel <laughs> no it's about a fish man actually a fish boy <laughs> actually i didn't even get into that but that might be a reason why this appealed to me uh that i drew my own undersea uh, adventure oh yeah yeah fish fish people are cool what else oh and uh, toho yaro the podcast that i co-host uh with alex kazanis from the one piece podcast and our friend v that's a japanese film club podcast as i mentioned earlier uh it's on hiatus at the moment but there's a big backlog to listen to i wouldn't recommend listening to any episodes before the message from space episode to start off that's like episode 30 something because we switch up the format at that point and really tighten things up and i think the show Mm -hmm. really improves kind of in the 30s and beyond i always get kind of annoyed when people are like oh yeah i'll listen to your podcast i'll start at episode one don't start episode one that's when we suck that's when we have no clue what the fuck we're doing yeah, we really shot ourselves in the foot by like covering some big ones like the original Godzilla and Lady Snowblood and all the ones that people actually want to listen to Aww. are those ones where we didn't know what we were doing, but we're a little bit more tighter now. And, and uh, I think my advice with that show is to either pick a movie that you've seen or a movie that you don't mind just hearing some spoilers about and listen to us talk about it. I think that's it. Thanks so much again for coming on to the show. Mm-hmm. Thank you for introducing me to Hard Boiled Cop and Dolphin. Oh, yes, for sure. <laughs> awesome. This is definitely a series I had a ton of fun, and you can see by the panels I posted in the yeah. no context panel chat. And also, thanks for just hanging out, chilling with us in the Discord. I really appreciate you just being a member of the community, too. Oh, yeah. I'm on the Discord all the time. So pop in there and say hey, and I'll talk about Shonen Jump stuff or whatever. <laughs> Hell, <laughs> yeah. That's the right place to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll have to talk about uh, One Piece. Maybe while we're waiting for the files to upload. I think all that's left is for us to go to shoutouts. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been David. This has been Jordan. This has been Joey. And you've been listening to Shonen Flop. Keep on flopping, floppers. Yeah. Yeah! yeah.